Okay, we'll con we are continuing today. The class is in memory of Jared Orchen. We we'll continue today on page 901. We we'll continue the Shema. Last week we learned the first, the first line and a little bit of the first paragraph. We we'll continue on the mitzvahs that are the first paragraph of Shema. The mitzvah that we have after loving Hashem is the mitzvah Veshinantam Levanecha. What means Veshinantam Levanecha? It's number seven. Teach them to your children, right? There is a mitzvah to teach to your children Torah. Then it's written, What means Speak to them. Speak about it. Speak to them, it's written. Speak of them. Speak of them. Speak different, not speak to them, speak of them. You have to learn yourself Torah. And as we're going to learn, see next next paragraph, it's the opposite. First you learn, then your children. But here it speaks about you have to teach your children Torah. But I don't know, then learn. Then you have your problem. Then you have a problem. You better learn. Then you'll be able to teach them. Now, Vishnatan Levanecha is a mitzvah of every Jew. Oblig every Jew is obligated to teach Torah, to teach his children Torah. Now, there is a famous story about the first Chabad Rabbi, the Alter Rabbi that when his child turned three or four years old, he called one of his chassidim and he told them, I have an obligation to teach my children Torah. You have an obligation to support your family. In the ketuba, it's written, yes, you have to, you, any man who signs a ketuba takes upon himself the responsibility to support his wife. Then let's exchange, he tells them. You learn Torah, and I, uh, you will teach my son Torah, and I will, and I will, uh, and I will, uh, it, it, that's what he spoke the story last week, and I will, and I will support your family. It's all based on Vishinantam Levanecha. Now, not only you don't have to teach not only your own children, Rashi says Vishinantam Levanecha, teach your children, these are the students. Every person is obligated to teach Torah. Everyone, not just his children. Every Jew. Every Jew. Then what's the difference? What's the obligation more for your children than for other people? What do you think? After all, if they're your children, probably there is a bigger obligation. I have to teach every Jewish child. Fine, but my children? Rashi says, Levanecha, it's based on basically the idea that when your true parent is the one who, give you, who, gives you, who teaches you Torah. There is, there is three partners in every human being. What are the three partners? What do you think? Mother, father, mother and God. 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 Your mother and father give you life in this world. Your teacher gives you life in the world to come, forever. That your teacher gives you lechu banim shimuli. It's written a pasuk in in the book of Psalms. I think it's in the book of Psalms. No. Um, I know it's not, I'm not sure it's when basically the, the verse says, Go, my sons, and I teach you Torah. Then from this we know in from other places that teaching Torah, a person who teaches Torah becomes the father of the person. In his, in he has to, there is the laws of honoring your parents and honoring your teacher are very similar. And sometimes the, law, the laws of honoring your parents are more than honoring your father. You, 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 honoring your teacher is even more than honoring your parents. That's how far it goes. Mm. But the world is different. If I have obligation to teach every child Torah and I have an obligation to teach my children, to make sure my children learn, for my children I have to pay tuition. For all the children? If I can teach them for free, fine. To pay for them to teach Torah? Now there is another discussion. To teach Torah, are you allowed to charge for teaching Torah? Talmud says, at least there is a bigger discussion about that. Talmud says, God says to the Jewish people, I taught you for free, right? God charge us anything for that, someone sign that? No. We should also, not, we should also teach for free. That there is opinion, some people say that only the written Torah we have to teach for free. The oral Torah we can charge. And so on. <laughs> it means to say the Talmud you can charge. For the written Torah, we have to teach for free. That's what God gave us for free. So what happens if you're teaching both the same day? You charge 50%. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you yeah. do something else and charge for that, and you teach at the same time. The real answer is, back to the story. Yeah. 
What he told him in the story. You are obligated. The, the Alter Rebbe didn't pay him for teaching his son Torah. He told him, I need, I have an obligation to teach my child Torah. He has no obligation to teach my child Torah. He has to go to work. Last exchange, he didn't tell him I'll pay you for the job. Because you cannot pay, so to speak, for the job. I will teach, I, you will teach my son Torah. I will support your family. Every teacher in a Jewish day school, in a yeshiva, is not paid for, for the profession. If he would be paid for the profession, he had to be paid like a, um, a professor in college. Like the professor are being paid in college. Not the professors are not being paid in college. Like those who are, are paid. He wants that tenure. <laughs> exactly. That's what we pay him. We pay him much less. We pay him enough to support his family. Barely, by the way. I didn't meet one teacher from any yeshiva who became rich. Not even rich, who lives comfortable. Really make it. Because they dedicate their life to teach Jewish long Torah. That we don't pay them for teaching Torah. We pay them, we give them the, the ability to release them, we release them from the obligation of supporting the family that they should be able to teach the, the children Torah. That's what we do. That's a Shinantam Levanecha and a Dibar Then we have to learn Torah ourselves. Then comes the next mitzvah. What's the next mitzvah? And by the way, when you have to learn Torah, when you are sitting home, right? When you go on your way, anytime. What's the of Kumecha teaches us? What do you learn from these two words? When you lay down and you stand up. What do you learn from it? Morning and night. What, what, which, when we learn, how we learn Torah in the morning and the night? We say the Shema. Why we say, we need to learn Torah every morning and every night. And night means after tonight, uh, by 10 to 9. After 10 to 9, the class now is considered still learning Torah during the day. It has to be learning Torah at night. Then we, the Shema, why we chose the Shema? Because in the Shema it's written the midst of learning Torah in the morning and night. Really can fulfill it in there with every learning Torah. We chose this because that's, that the Shema in the service is learning Torah. It's not a prayer, so to speak. Shema is not a prayer, officially. It's a piece on the Torah. You're learning Torah. You fulfill the mitzvah of learning Torah. Mm -hmm. You have to learn. Now, this is the minimum. The minimum is any a person has to go to work. You cannot learn Torah. Because on one hand, it's written, Vagita, Bo uh, Yoman, Valayla. You have to learn Torah day and night. A whole day and a whole night. If I don't have time, I have to go to work. I have an obligation to support my family. What should I do? If I learn Torah all day and all night, I get a big headache. I need to relax. You're allowed to. But you have to do the minimum. The minimum is learning Torah. At least the Shema, one line, one, or something in the beginning, something in the morning, and something at night. That's the Shema. That's the mitzvah. When you lay down, those mean literally laying down in bed. Time when you lay down. When you wake up, time when you wake up. That's why the Shema... As a time, as a time period. When is the when is the night shema? What time can you learn, read the night shema? Three stars. Until what time? Until uh, what time? An hour before sun up. Or oh. Until what time? You learn brachas? No. Yeah, it, it's about it's an hour. It's about an hour before. It, when you could see something that you could. You see. are all right, but in brachas is written something different. It's written that the rabbis made a law until midnight. Midnight, I don't mean until midnight, 12 o'clock. Midnight, the half of the day, no? From sunrise to sunset, you split it in half, that's what midnight is. Now midnight is probably 1.15 or something. Then until midnight, you have to read the Shema. The mitzvah is when the night comes, you shouldn't do anything else because you might forget. You know, a person comes to from work, comes from class, he's tired, he sits down on the couch, before as long as he's sleeping already, forget about the shema, forget about anything. <laughs> then you feel thing before you sit down to eat supper. A Jew, before he's doing anything, it comes night, he dumps. He says the shema. Then he's doing a lot of business. What if you forgot to say the shema after midnight? Until midnight, you're allowed to say it until, until uh, uh, done. So is the, saying the Shema a biblical commandment then? 
הביבליקל קומן, יא... מה זה סייד משפט? לא נפתור, מה נגיד? יא. בעצם זה שמע זה ביבליקל קומן, כן. זה אינטרפרטיב, כי זה לא אומר שמע, אבל זה עדיין לא ביבליקל קומן. כן, זה ביבליקל קומן, כי ביבליקל קומן זה עדיין לא נפתור בבוקר ובבוקר 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 ובבוקר. And, and, and what to say, that the rabbis, in every biblical commandment, the rabbis framed it, what to do and how to do it. You understand? What mm-hmm. the, well, the Shema is a biblical commandment, yes. Mm-hmm. Comes. Then in the morning, what is the time in the morning? From when until when can you say the Shema? It's approximately an hour before the actual, it, it's, it's before the actual sun rises. From sunrise, basically, yeah, the better time. Yeah. Until when? Until three hours mm-hmm. in the day. What is it now? 10 o'clock, 10, no, 9.30 or something, 9.30 or so, the three, first third of the day, the first, yeah, the first third of the day, no, the first quarter of the day, it's 9.05 now, the first quarter of the day, I think, this is the mitzvah of the Shema, that's b'shor b'chov kumecha, when you lay down on your eyes, then comes the next mitzvah, in the, look what's going on in the Shema, in this little paragraph, the whole Judaism is down, וכשרתם לאות על ידיך, והיו לתותפות בין עיניך. Let's see what's written in English. Um, bind, bind this word as a sign on your end, and let them be an emblem? What is this? In the center of your head. If you would be at the moon, what would you do? An emblem. What would you do with it, with this statement? What should you bind them? Bind this word on your end, Put an emblem on your, on your head. Yeah, yes. I, don't, I still don't know what an emblem is, but it's well, okay. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's like if you, you have a mezuzah or a picture of it. it a symbol. A symbol of some kind. A right? symbol of your head. Okay, Moses told us what does this mean. Tie it on your head. The, the film. Again, it's a biblical mitzvah, but it's not written clear. Yeah. The the rabbi in, is, but the interpretation is the interpretation is, is, is what? The interpretation is rabbinic? The interpretation is no. considered rabbinic, but okay. it's a biblical mitzvah, yeah. Well, well, actually, Moses told us right at the beginning. Hashem tells Moshe. But it's considered rabbinic, he's right. It's not written in the Torah exactly what to do. You cannot say that this is a biblical mitzvah exactly how to do it. I don't think, the fr- I don't think you can say in every detail in the film that it's a biblical mitzvah. The mitzvah is to put on film. How to put it on? If you want to do it the right way, the biblical mitzvah, you have to listen to what the Moses told us how to do it. Then we have to tie the film over uh, and, uh, what the rabbis told us to put the film. In general, it's an important thing to remember. All, every mitzvah that we, uh, the, every mitzvah that's written in the Bible is not written clear how to do it. The rabbis are the one who tell us how to do it. And this is a perfect example. Tie it on your end. It's not written what to tie. Put an emblem on your head, it's not written what to put. Whatever you put, whatever you'll do is a commentary. Some people say, I don't want your commentaries, give me the text. You cannot do anything with the text. If you want to observe the mitzvah, if you just learn for the sake of learning, you don't care if the text is not clear. I don't care, it's not a, it's not a practical question what to put on your head. But if you have to put it on your head, you have to know what to put. What am I going to put on my head? Then we tell you, if that came Moses and told us what to put on our head. It has to be film, it has to be a box made out of skin of an animal, and inside there has to be parchment, and what is the written on the parchment, and the four paragraphs of the, of the midst of film is written, go all the details of film. But let's say somebody says, I don't believe this rabbi who came up with this idea. He comes with his own idea. It's also his own idea. Why should I take your idea better than the other idea? What should I put here, a potato? What should I put? Whatever I will put will be a commentary. Why, why is the text so general and it's Ah, oh, yeah, 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 you're asking the million dollar question. Okay, because you asked, even it's not a part of the, of the this, in one word, God purposely wrote the Torah in an unclear way, way fashion. Why? There's many explanations, but one main explanation is God wanted that a person should need a t- will need a teacher. He will never be able, will never be able to give and your son your book. Okay, take the book. You, you, as everything is written there, because then you will never teach your child Torah. You'll never feel the urgency of teaching your children Torah. The books is available. You can go ahead 
and read the books. If you will not teach your children Torah, what is going to happen? Nothing will happen. It will be gone in one generation, in two generations. The Yiddish language was alive for how many years? How long did you spoke Yiddish? 1,000 years. 1,000 years. Okay, 1, how, quick, how quick it went, went away. I forgot. One generation, two generations, over, done. Mm -hmm. You can sell it. You can bury it. Nobody speaks Yiddish. To forget is easy. To remember is much harder. Then the Hashem wanted we should have to teach. So your son is asking you, what should I learn? Like, you don't understand anything it's written here. You need to have a teacher. The same thing is here. More, now more than that, why God wanted teachers? Because a book is a cold thing. A book doesn't teach you anything. A book gives you information, does give, doesn't give you the experience. God wanted we should have the experience, not just the, not just the, the, the information. Somebody was standing at Mount Sinai, he tells his son, you know what was going on at Mount Sinai? You read, Ten Commandments, do not kill, do not steal, oh, that's nice. He tells you. It was turned there, he, he describes Mount Sinai. God wanted that the teaching should be a contagious experience. The excitement should go over. That's what God wanted. And for this, you need teachers. This, without a teacher, doesn't fly. And you see people learn Torah by themselves. After a while, they dry out. They need a teacher. They need a group of people to learn Torah together. That's what makes it. Now, that's the mitzvah of film. It's written in the Talmud. Whatever Hashem tells the Jewish people to do, he himself is doing. And the Medrash says, Hashem told us to put on film. He himself is putting on film. What does this mean? It's it literally, says it. literally or figuratively? You tell me what figuratively means. In Brochas. It does, it says. What, what does this mean? When, what does this mean? What's written in the film? Hashem is one. That the Talmud says, what's written in God's film? The Jewish people are. That the Jewish people are the only nation on earth. His nation, his people. It means to say, when we think in God, that this is the only God, He's the only God, we don't have anything else. At the same time, He thinks about us, that we are the only thing on earth. It's a double, it's a reflection. God is our reflection. The way we relate to Him, that's the way He relate to us. We have faith in Him, He gives us the same level of relationship. Then when we put on film, He puts on film. Why? Well, go ahead. You want to tell me something? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I found something. Again, do we take that literally or figuratively? What do you mean figuratively? Well, he, he, he's not physically putting something on and taking it off. I guess those who've taken that literally yeah. have said that that means God it's has a body. Earlier, <laughs> this is the earlier reference. What? For what? For film? For film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in, it must in, also in be a uh, sign on your arm and a reminder in the center of your head. Yes, yes. This is in uh, Exodus, right? Yes, Bo. In Bo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then what, when you when you say figurative, what, what, what's, well, what that, are you there's some to? who say that that means that God has a physical body and God is putting. God on forbid! Physical. God forbid! I understand, forbid, but God that's forbid. why I'm saying if you take it literally, it sounds like God well, has a body. It's <laughs> literal, but it's on a spiritual level. It's, it's Figuratively nothing. means I, that's what I said. When you think about God, God thinks about you. That's what it is. It's not a physical thing. God does not have a hand. No, it doesn't have a nose. It doesn't have a hand. It's not a body. It's not anything. It's not even a, any type of. Descriptable, uh, uh, you, can, you cannot even describe him. God. Well, yeah, it's marked as I mean, there are those who can describe God as having a spiritual body, you might say. No, it's not <laughs> even have a spiritual body. It's also a way for us to relate to it. It's, it's, it's like if you're talking to a child and he's got you, you talk about building blocks with him because he can't really relate to the complexities <laughs> of, the, of the materials. It's for a child, a child thinks it's a, it's, it's a physical thing. As you get older, you take off the layers. You understand? God is not even this and not even this. It's more. Mm -hmm. More abstract than this. So it, it, we do take it figuratively or metaphorically. Sure, absolutely, then. metaphorically. That's a better word. Yes. Comes the Baal and says, the end film, and the end film, the end film, the end film you put by the out, right? And the end film we put over our head. You know why? The, Talmud, the Jewish law says when you put on your, on your end, you have to remember to have to subdue your heart to God. And when you read, you have to subdue your mind to God. That everything that your mind and your heart want should be only what God wants. Then why we don't put on that film on our heart, literally? Why on our end? Because we need to do. The main thing is to do. 
symbol of action, right? Action. Now, which film we put on first? The end or the head? Head. The head. Yeah, we'll the, 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 the arm first. And then we take the soft. What do you take off first? You take yeah, off the head, head, right? To teach us what's more important. Actions. Actions speak loud as the world. Philosoph philosophies, I'm learning, I'm thinking about God, I was, I was about, I'm going to. I'm actions. The feeling of the end are the most important thing. God wants actions. Deal. Don't think. You, have, you, have, you, have, you, uh, you, you you want to know a bottom line. You make you make an accounting. Well, how much money your business made? How much money? How much? How much ice cream cones you sell? Mm -hmm. That's what counts. I was. It was about. It was sell. It was want. It came. It want. It looked. It. Call it all out. Tell me the bottom line. What happened? We made it or we lost? That's the bottom line. Judaism is a bottom line religion. It's an and ends on religion. It's all about action. We connect to God through action. And there is Jews who learn Torah. They are the edit film. There are Jews who do mitzvahs. The main thing is to do mitzvahs, the end film. Came the Baal Shem Tov and said, you know, in the olden days, three, four hundred, five hundred years ago in Poland, the Jews who learn Torah were the high society, the elite. They were the, the, the respected. And the Jews who were simple Jews, they were religious Jews, but simple Jews, they never learned how to read in any language. They never had an education. They never went to school. They were... Who, the poverty in Europe in the in four five hundred years ago three hundred years ago was unbelievable. The poverty, terrible. They knew nothing. That these Jews were looked upon as second class citizens, not second class, fifth class citizens. Then came the Baal Shem Tov, and he said, "What's going on here? These Jews are so loved by God, they do mitzvahs." And he said like this: "The end film comes before the end film, right? We put on them before." The Jews who do mitzvahs come before the Jews who learn Torah. Because ultimately, the goal of the world is to conquer the world. The goal of God is to do mitzvahs in the physical world. To learn Torah, be isolated and, and, and locked up in a yeshiva, in a room, and learning Torah, you didn't change the world. But when you go out, you're a professional, you go a businessman, you go out to the world, and you do what you're supposed to do. As a Jew, that's the goal. That's the difference of the first and second generation of the desert. Yeah. And then also a difference in philosophy between, you know, different uh, groups today. I mean, there are certainly a number of people who are studying yeshivas and do that full time. There is. <laughs> and I think they, I think you're right. That's, that's the Hasidic movement, absolutely. And the Hasidic movement said, beside everything the Rabbi said, that in our generation, there is so many Jews are assimilated. So many Jews are being lost. Mm -hmm. It's a fire outside. Can you imagine you're sitting in the shiv and you're learning? Somebody tells you there is a fire because the, the other building is burning, and people are have to be saved. They don't have time for learning Torah. You have to go out and save Jews, save the world. What we save them, help them to find a way to Judaism, save them from assimilation, from intermarriage. <coughs> then our job, we have a huge job. We cannot we cannot afford the luxury. Even he will say that there is a place for such a thing as learning Torah all day. It's a big, a big argument altogether, if, if this is the goal. But let's say there is such a thing. We can, our generation, we cannot afford the luxury of sitting in our own room and, 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 and learning Torah and be excited. The Rabbi also would enjoy to learn Torah. He was a huge genius. He enjoyed to learn and learn and learn. And the Rabbi used to meet a, big, a great scholar. It was the highlight of his day. He was like lost. He met him, he met a big scholar in the middle of this. He, middle, he walked out, he started to talk to him. He, can be, he, he had another 50 things on the agenda. Didn't make a difference. He enjoyed to learn Torah. The secretary said, and he used to bring him a new book. He knew that's it. <laughs> the Rebbe used to take every new book, start like this, go over page by page until he finished it. He never had to look again at it. But the moment he got the book, that was it. I mean, it was like, Mm -hmm. This guy is waiting for an answer. There is a, a question about an operation. There is life. He said he felt bad, and one, and he knew he would not get the answers. He better ask the questions first and then give the book. But now that I knew, he brings the rabbi, <laughs> brings the rabbi a lot of joy. Such a thing that he always had the dilemma: what to give the rabbi first. 
that he could sit and learn Torah all his life, he would be more. But he knew that the world needs to go out and bring out Judaism to Jews. We cannot afford these luxuries of what we want. Then this is the end film before the end film. Then he says, you should write mezuzahs on your door, right? That says, um, also write them on, your do uh, on the doorpost uh, door of your houses and gates. It's not written what? Again, mezuzah is not written. What is a mezuzah? You have to, I mean, the rabbis told us what to write, and it's again the two paragraphs of the Shema are inside the mezuzah. That's what we put up on our door. Then why we put up the mezuzahs on the door? What do you think? What's the reason of the midst of mezuzah? Protection. For remembering, uh, to remind you. Passover, yeah. To remind us. To remind us about God. That's number one. Number two, it also brings us protection. It also creates boundaries. Ah? Huh? Creates boundaries. Boundaries, what do you mean? What's kind of holy and what's not, or the, where you, is your coming and going? When you're coming into your house, it's a... You remind you, that's the same idea, you remind you about God. Then the first job of the mezuzah is to remind you about God. And it's true, it also is the power of protection. There is a story about um, Rabbi Yudah, the prince. He was a leader of the Jewish people, he behaved like a king, he was almost like a king. And he had very good relationships with other emperors and kings. Once he got a present from another king, and he sent them a very expensive diamond with a leather, and he told them, I want to establish a relationship with you. <coughs> then the, now the messenger arrived, he made for him Rebbe, Rebbe he, called, he was called Rebbe, he made for him a big, a big event, a big uh, meal, and a party to welcome him, and he told them, I need you for a few days here until I can send you the gift back to, the, to your king. He commissioned a Jew, to write a, a rabbi, to write, to write a, a mezuzah, a nice mezuzah. He rolled them up with a letter, sent them back. The other king couldn't wait long enough to see what is he sending him back. He's way, he finally arrives, he opens it. He says, it's a, it's a paper. He was insulted. He sends him back a letter, he tells him, I sent you a diamond, you're sending me a paper? that Rebbe sent him an amazing statement. He told him, you sent something that I have to put up guards to protect it. I sent you something that can protect you. Mm. How does the mezuzah protect? Is it the same philosophy as on Passover with the blood on the doorposts? Or? The do well, what's, okay, what's the philosophy of the, do of the doorpost, the blood? You tell me. Well, at least Maimonides says. I mean, it's yeah. a symbol of, you know, the, sacrificing of the of idolatry for all intents and purposes, and that was the symbol of that. It means to say, when you, not the, not the blood on the doorpost makes the, makes the protection, the mitzvah makes the protection. Because you made the mitzvah that you slaughter the, the idolatry, you, you risk your life against all the Egyptian, right? That the mitzvah made it. The same thing here. When you do what Hashem tells you, that protects you. But in this mitzvah, from this story, what we see, um, what was his name, this king? Auto or something, I forgot his name. He is not Jewish. He's not obligated to put on a mezuzah. The mitzvah he doesn't have. But the, in the nature of the mezuzah, there is something of protection. Every mitzvah has a nature, has something to it. Kosher food gives you less problems in the stomach. If you want to cure your stomach problems, eat kosher food. If you want to have healthy children, Go to the mikveh. If you want to not have fears, psychological fears, put on film. If you want to have healthy legs, give charity. And charity is in general for protection from death. If you want to have protection, every mitzvah, not every mitzvah we know, but every mitzvah as is nature of the mitzvah, the Rebbe called it. The mezuzah from this story, why I brought this story? Rabbi Yudah the prince sent the mezuzah to a non-Jew. You understand? He didn't send it to a Jewish person. Why? Because even a non-Jew, if he will have a mezuzah, will protect him. The Rabbi had a mezuzah in the, in the car. Not on the door of the car, but just in the glove department or whatever. Because the mezuzah has a nature of protection. Not the mezuzahs that people... We run this little thing, well, not a mezuzah or nothing. I'm talking about a mezuzah in a normal way, in a respectful way. In the 
And how does that provide protection? Is it the sense that you're doing something God commands and therefore God protects you? Because, no, no, because God put in the nature of this mitzvah the power of protection. But what's the mitzvah putting it in the uh, glove compartment? I told you. It's as a power of protection. I understand that, but what's yeah. the actual... Not, not, not because it's of not the because mitzvah. It's not because the mitzvah would be... A mitzvah is a commandment of Hashem. You write, the, God made in... When you write a mezuzah, the way it should be written, mm-hmm. this mezuzah has a certain power of protection. Does it say that... Even if it's not on the doorpost. Okay. Is that a biblical concept or a rabbinic concept? Or? It's probably a rabbinic concept, but... Um, how we came up to the whole idea that the mezuzah is a protection? You tell me. Like I said, the, the parallel story in Passover where you know, we put there the blood on the law, doorpost. It's <laughs> not is, it, is it a midrash? No, it's more, it's, it's a loch, it's a more formal, okay. more formal sure, much more formal. But it uh, could be it starts when the mezuzah is there, that God will protect you, will pass over you. You're right. But the concept is a Kabbalistic concept that in the mitzvah there is a certain nature that the mitzvah has power to do. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? There is a story, for example, I want to turn and put it down one or two <coughs> points, it's a little warm. Now. There is a story, you know, there is an tra- old tradition, Jewish tradition, that uh, you will take a lulav and etrog for Sukkot. After Sukkot, to take the etrog and to make from it, uh, you know, uh, what, you make from, what can you make from etrog? Salad? Jam or a jelly? Mm-hmm. Jelly. Thank you. And eating it, one way or another, eating it for a woman who has a hard time to get pregnant can bring you a blessing to get pregnant. Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the Rebbe once gave it to a woman who did not have children. The Rebbe wanted to give her a bracha. So it was after Sukkot. She came for dialysis to New York from Israel. The Rebbe told her, but don't tell anybody. I will give you two etrogs. Don't, don't tell anybody. Don't tell outside anybody outside the door. She walks out of this. Your brother asks her, what is it? That she told them. She says she felt she lost the blessing right there. <coughs> she never had children. <coughs> but you see, the concept, it's a Kabbalistic concept that every mitzvah has a certain, for example, about the, at charity, we say, Zdakat atil mi mavet. Charity will save you from your life. What's the connection between charity and life? Torah says the charity will save you from, 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 uh, from your life. It says a connection. When somebody is sick, we tell the, the, we, it's written we should check the mezuzahs and film. The rabbi used to say it all the time. What's the connection? Film is film, and doctor is a doctor. No, by a Jewish person, the physical and the spiritual go like this. They're connected. I know a story from Miriam's and in South Africa, that she had, she was delivering a baby, and the baby was upside down, and they, they, the doctor said, we'll have to do a surgery. They called the Rebbe, the Rebbe said to check the mezuzahs. They checked the mezuzahs, one mezuzah was upside down. Mm-hmm. They fixed it, the baby was delivered naturally. Mm-hmm. What's the con- yeah, it's a mitzvah, but what's the connection to bathing babies? In Judaism, it goes like this. There is no such thing as one thing here and one thing there. If you give charity, you do well in the business. What's the connection? We have to give charity because people are poor. Doing well in business, I have to be a good, uh, good guy, I have a good this. I have to go with his business. I have to be a, sh- a shrewd businessman. No. They are all connected in Judaism. One are connected to the other. Our spiritual, spiritual physical st- state of, of life is so connected. We don't, we don't even know how connected. Our, when, when is it a spiritual reason and it's a physical reason? You almost don't know what you need to fix first. Should I go to the doctor? Why should I just not fix the mezuzah? My father is the first fix the mezuzah, then go to the doctor. He didn't waste time on going to the doctor. Ah, forget about the doctor. Mm-hmm. Is that your vote? <laughs> he used to put my father is when one of the children is to be sick, he used to put ten 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 cents in the charity box, say his name, it is mother same thing. Don't worry, you will be healthy. And he became healthy. Didn't need any the, our spiritual connection with God and our physical uh, because our um, physical reality is so connected, is so spiritual that it's all dependent on, on our spiritual connection with God. That's the first paragraph of the Shema. Now there is a second paragraph of the Shema on Parshas Ekev, last week's Parsha. No, that's the way. 
Do we know who put these paragraphs of the Shema together? Uh, if I would know, I would ask Scala. Yeah. And, uh, it's from Moses' time. Sure, that would be the film, right? That would be the film. The connection of the Shema is clear. The two paragraphs is clear. It's the same mitzvah, it's the same thing. Both of them speak about learning Torah, doing mitzvahs, uh, putting a film. The third paragraph, though, is a little bit different. Yeah, oh, that's a whole different right? story, the third paragraph, yes. We'll get to the third paragraph. What's going on? But, but does that trace back to Moses, or is that a historical development no. that all three uh, paragraphs? The three paragraphs? <laughs> no, I think, it's, I think it's, um, it's from Moses. Yeah, I think it's from Moses. It's right here on page 923. On the surface, the second paragraph is the same story with the first paragraph. The same mitzvahs, right? Why are we repeating ourselves? It speaks about the sh uh, teaching your children Torah. It speaks about putting up a mezuzah. 923, number 13. 923. Mezuzah, film. Well, what's going on here? The same story again. What is different in the second paragraph? Number one, you know what's different in the second paragraph? Before, before that, it talks about reward and punishment. <coughs> the first paragraph, you have to do it no matter reward, no matter not reward. You have to do it. The second paragraph speaks about if you, what will happen if you do, what happens if you don't do. The Ayah and Shema, if you listen to what Hashem says, God will be reigning. And will. But there is another difference, and that's what he mentioned. Very, very important difference. Singular or plural. You see, in English, that's, a pro that's one of the problems of translating something to a different language. In, e in English, you is one, and you is ten, right? You is plural, you is singular. In Hebrew, the first paragraph is written in singular, the second paragraph is written in plural. The first paragraph is, after you should love as Hashem Elokecha, you God, with all your heart, with all your mind. In the second paragraph, it's written, Bechol Levavchem, it told you hard. It told all of you together. It's a collective order, not an individual. Why God changed it from one to many? What's the message? What do you think? It both applies to the individual and applies to the group. Community. Community. So if I talk to every one of you, is that applied to the community? If I wouldn't say to every one of you, I would say it's only to the community. When we come together in shul, we'll say shema. You know, we, when we come together, we'll put on the mezuzah in, on the shul. In my own house, it's I'm an individual. But if I tell to every one of you, you love your God, with all your heart, then what I need? A, what I need? A, because you're binding us all thing. together because the reward and punishment is on the basis of the community. Oh, there is something very, very important. It's written, let's, read, read, let's read, read a little bit inside what's written, what will be if you do what Hashem wants. You want to read? If you? If you are careful to pay heed to my commandments, which I am prescribing to you today, and if you love God your Lord with all your heart and soul, then God has made this promise. Mm -hmm. I will grant the fall and spring rains in your land at the proper times. In the proper times. I can see, I can see a few Jews in Israel sitting there. There is droughts, plenty in Israel. And they say, they say to the rabbi, I'm doing what Hashem wants. Why it's not raining? It should rain in my backyard. This is my neighbor, this guy, oh, should rain one drop in his backyard. It doesn't work like this. It's a collective contract. God made a contact with the Jewish people. If all of you will, will do my commandment, then all of you will have good. And if all of you will not do, we are all dependent on each other. We are not individuals. And that means, we spoke before, how much we have to be responsible for each other because the whole, whole, whole uh, deal is a, is a deal from a community. The obligation to love your God in the first paragraph is on me, no matter what happens. Should love your God, it all your heart, it all your mind, should put on film. Now comes to the second paragraph, reward and punishment. That's a collective business. That's why we say in the, in the prayer, what we say after, after the Amidah, what's the prayer we say? 
confession, right? What did it start with the word? Ashamnu, Bogadnu, Gozano. You know, the language in Hebrew is also in plural. If it would be about myself, it would be Ashamti, Bagadeti. Ashamnu means we sinned. Now, why people, people, many people say, I, don't, I didn't do it. Asham, no. <laughs> they did. I do it for, I say it for them. But the real truth is, even if I think that I'm righteous, let's say a very righteous man, he says it for everybody. First of all, because, why he says it for everybody? Because oh, there is other people saying, but more than that. He's responsible for every, everybody. If somebody all <laughs> sinned, it's his problem. <coughs> That's what the problem is. If somebody else saying that means that I didn't do my job, that's why it happened, it reached to this level. If I wouldn't sit in my home and, and take care only of myself and go out and teach Torah, this person would also be better. That it's Osham Nu, it's my sin, it's my problem. That's the whole idea of the reward of punishment. That's why people said, why God is doing this and why God is doing this? It's not that I was right and I was, let's say, first of all, who can say that he was perfect? First of all. But let's say you're perfect. Let's say. Let's assume <laughs> this dream that you are perfect. They are all in one pot. It's in one boat. So, you know, when then somebody says, Why are you interfering in my business if I want to do a mitzvah or not? Mind your own business. In America, it's a very famous line. Mind your own business, right? I tell them, I mind my own business. Your business is my business. <laughs> if you don't do well, it's my problem. It's like we are all in the same boat and somebody drills a hole in his room. <laughs> It's my room, I paid for it, get out of here, I will do whatever I want. It doesn't work like this. We are all in the same boat. And therefore, when I mind, I don't mind any, that's why Jewish people are nosy. They stick their noses in everybody's business and know everything, give opinions. Nobody ever asked them. And they all get interfering, that's what creates all fights. It all comes from our collective responsibility for each other. It goes, you know, nothing goes on one way. <laughs> it goes on both ways. That's, what, that's why it's in, it's in a collective, it's in, it's in a plural, not in a singular. There is another thing about it. The first par uh, second paragraph repeats the same mitzvahs, right? The question is, why you repeat the same mitzvahs? We heard already the first time. We read in the first time, we read about Shinanton Levanecha, should teach your children Torah. We read in the second paragraph, we read in the we should teach your children Torah. We read about putting a film, you read Mimizuz, everything. The first paragraph is talking about, is not talking about reward and punishment. You have to put on film, you have to do the mitzvahs because Hashem asked me. For the right reason. The second paragraph is an incentive. That's why we speak about reward and not reward and punishment. A person, the first paragraph is when the Jewish people were in the time of the temple. They were all the time when the Jews were in the desert. We spoke last week in the desert, God, Moses didn't even say they after to begin with. But in the time of the temple, we needed, we said we needed, we needed a commandment to love God, but we didn't need incentives for it. We were loving God anyway, and our own naturally. Came the time of exile. We don't see God. We don't see miracles. We go, and there is no temple to go and to see the revealed power of God. That we need some incentives. We're getting old. We're getting, we're getting tired. Then we, we give us the incentive, the reward and punishment. That's a different than the same mitzvahs, even at Mondades. I would think that all the first mitzvahs I would have to do only in the Israel, only in the land of Israel. I have to do the mitzvahs. Comes the second paragraph and tells us that we have to do the mitzvahs even outside of Israel. Wherever you go, you have to do the mitzvahs. That film, the mezuzah, and learning Torah is not a land bound mitzvah. You know, there is mitzvahs who are land bound. There is mitzvahs that you do. What's a mitzvah that's land bound, for example? You can give me an example of a mitzvah dependent on the land of Israel. To not work the land. Not to work the land of Israel, yeah. The mitzvah of Maaser. It's all mitzvahs. 
But the mitzvah, but the but the land, the mitzvahs, the mitzvahs in in uh, of film mezuzah, and learning Torah, is a mitzvah that's everywhere, no matter where you go, no matter where you stand. And that's why the second paragraph is even when you will be exiled. What's written in the second paragraph? If you look at in the introduction to the second mitzvah, uh, and you look at number, for example, let's start read number sixteen. Don't do it. Be careful that your heart not be tempted to go astray and worship other gods, bowing down to them. God's anger will then be directed against you, and he will lock up the skies so that there will be no, not be any rain. The land will not give forth its crops, and you will rapidly vanish from the good land that God has given you. You'll vanish. Then comes, continue. Place these words of mine on your heart and your soul. Yeah. Bind them as signs on your arms. Meets of film, learning to art film, and? And let them be an insignia in the center of your head. Very good. Teach your children to speak of them when you are at home, when you are traveling on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Continue one more line. Also, write them on parchments affixed to the doorposts. Very good. Then the introduction to the mitzvahs in the second paragraph, the same mitzvahs that in the first paragraph. Putting on film, mezuzahs, learning Torah with your children, you tell yourself, what introduction? God forbid you be exiled. You should learn Torah too. No stories. The obligation of learning Torah and doing this mitzvah is even when you are in exile. Not only when you are in the land of Israel. That's what he says. Now it's another interesting thing. What's written first in the first paragraph of the Shema? Which mitzvah is written first? You tell me. Love your God. Love your God. Continue next. Next. All your resources. Next. Learning Torah or Tfilm. Which mitzvah is In the first paragraph, Torah or Tfilm? What's first? Torah or mitzvah? Tfilm represents all the mitzvahs. That first learning Torah, then putting on film, then mitzvahs, right? Look at the second paragraph. What's written first? Place these words of mine in your heart and soul, bind them as a sign on your arm, and let them be an insignia in the sun of your head. And then? Teach your children to speak. Ah. First, do mitzvahs, then learn Torah. What's the difference? What's going on here? The first paragraph speaks on the time of the temple. In the time of the temple, were people more spiritual, and they saw God, and they were excited. Then learning Torah goes number one. Then you do. Then also you have to do mitzvahs, obviously. The second paragraph speaks about time of exile. You will be let on out of the land. Then what Hashem tells us, number one, do mitzvahs. Then you learn Torah. Put on film, then you learn Torah. That's why the Rebbe's campaign, the first campaign was how to touch a Jew, put them on film. Let them put them on the door. Let a woman light a candle. Do with them things. The action is the strongest connection that a person can have to God. Then start to philosophize with them, oh, 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 this, Kabbalah, blah, 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 all these nice, nice philosophies. There were other organizations who went more with the attitude of, we'll do seminars, we'll, do, we'll teach them. The rabbi's attitude was, no, we touch them with an action. You connect them to God right away. And then everything will come by itself based on this paragraph of Shema. This is it. This is the time of exile. In the time of the temple, learning Torah comes first. Then putting a film. Tfilm, it Talmud says, Uksha kola Torah the film. The old Torah is compared to Tfilm. It's, 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 it film represents the old Torah. And we saw in history, look, how many people come here to learn Torah? 10. In a good day, 15. How many people come to show? How many people come to hear the shofar? Hundreds. A mitzvah. People come. People, more, more people connect to do a mitzvah than to learn Torah. If the sermon will be two hours and the prayers will be 15 minutes, how many people will be in shul? <laughs> None, right? Depends on how good the sermon is. <laughs> no matter how good the sermon is. No matter how good the sermon is. But the people... Some people think, oh, I'll give them explanations, I'll give them lectures. Nobody wants so many lectures. The people want to do, to be engaged. Even prayer is a mitzvah. It's, it's a mitzvah to do. People want to do things to connect to God. And that's what the, that's what the second paragraph is. 
more than that, you know, it's really, there is a verse that says, Sur mera vaase tov. Who can translate it? Sur mera vaase tov. Martel. Sur mera vaase tov. You know what it means, sur mera? Remove yourself from evil and do good. That means the order is first to stop to do bad and then to do good. Came the Rebbe and he said in the name of the Baal Shem Tov that he said in our generations, no, it doesn't work like this. I say Tov, do good, then Sumerah. Then remove yourself from evil. How are you going to remove him from evil? Engage him in good. Don't tell him what not to do. Tell him what to do. Automatically he will not be busy with what not to do. That's why the old attitude of Chabad is in a positive way. We don't speak about you're not allowed to speak Loshanor. Don't speak evil about your friend. We speak about love your fellow Jew. If I love you, I will not speak evil about you. If I care for you, I will already not steal from you. I will not rip you off. If I do good, and, and the, the, that's the, ex, the order of exile is, then we see we have three periods in Jewish history. In the time of the desert, the Jewish people didn't even need <coughs> incentive. They didn't even the, the mitzvah of after is Hashem alakechol. Moses didn't even tell them to love God, right? We spoke about that last week, because God gave them everything. If you don't love God, you are an idiot. I mean, God gave you everything. Your child, your father, your parent gives you everything. How could you not love them? Something is really wrong if you don't love your parents when they take care of you. Dead, man, everything. Then come the first. Then they came into the land of Israel. The land of Israel. During the time of the temple, they were more living in the first paragraph of the Shema. Love your God with all your heart and all your mind. Put on film. They didn't need any incentives. They saw God in front of their eyes. You walked into the temple. There was one candle in the temple used to burn 24-7. By a miracle. Until the next night, until the, not 24-7, but 24 hours. Until they lighted again. All the other candles, they used to put in the, all the oil, the same amount of oil in all the candles. All the other candles used to burn out. One candle used to burn until, until, uh, until, the next, uh, until the next evening. That a person walked into the temple, he saw God. Then in the time of the temple, you tell him, put on film, he puts on film. You put on put on mezuzah, he puts on mezuzah. Then he goes to exile. He doesn't see God. Where is God? People ask him, where is God? How could be this and this tragedies of the Jewish people? Where is your God? He doesn't see God many times. If he wants to, he has to put on a little better set of glasses. He will see God. But if he doesn't have the lenses, he wasn't by an eye doctor lately. You know what? The job of a rabbi is to be sometimes an eye doctor. Is to open, to check your uh, vision and to clean it up a little bit. You'll see God. Take, take a map and take your glasses off and clean up the dust. You'll see God. We have sometimes dust on our soul. We don't see God. We clean up the dust. We start to see God. Then we need incentive. If you do the mitzvah, if you do learn Torah, Hashem will help you. You live long. In the second paragraph, it's written also. If you, uh, if you, we didn't read the last line. If you do this, you and your children, um, cause of you want to read it. If you do this, you and your children will long endure on the land that God swore to your ancestors, promising that he would give it to them as long as the heavens are above Then the all, by the end of all of this, God gives a promise, you live long. Another incentive. Right? For all the mitzvahs. It's not written in the first paragraph. In time of exile, we need another incentive. We need incentives. Rewards if you do good, punishment if you do bad. And most importantly, in the time of the temple, Torah comes before mitzvahs. And the time of exile, mitzvahs come before Torah. More important to do the mitzvah, to impor, encourage other people to do mitzvahs, small mitzvahs, one little, one little thing at a time, and that's how you connect them to God. Very few people you connect to God with learning. More people you connect with mitzvahs. Just out of curiosity, I mean, it looks like uh, this is a line that uh, is not in exile because it says, if you do this in your children, you will long endure on the land. So. Isn't that a, a, a land-bound commandment? It's a land-bound. It's another discussion. Very good question. I was, I was wondering if somebody would bring this up or to leave it for another discussion. But yeah, you, you have a point. But ultimately, you make the land of Israel everywhere. There was a story about a chosid came to the Tzemach Tzedek and told him, Rabbi, I want to make Aliyah to Israel. He told them, make here Israel. The job of Jews is not to run away to Israel. 
It's to make everywhere they go Israel. What's Israel? A place that you feel God, that you see God. That's our job, to make every place Israel. The new job, our job, is to make from Solon Israel. This is Mount Sinai, <laughs> and the rest of Solon is the land of Israel. <laughs> <laughs> we get everything, Mount Sinai in Israel. <laughs>